had a bit of a wardrobe malfunction. My three-year-old attacked me this morning with jammy hands and I had a short top on, so now I'm a little bit struggling because I've <laughs> changed my top. So uh, I, hope it, I hope it stays on. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to start by thinking about who here has experienced work-related stress. I'm going to go for the Jamie Oliver TEDx um, way and say, raise your hands if you've experienced stress in the workplace. Yeah, pretty much all of us, okay, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an issue, it's a problem, you know, it's, we've all experienced stress, you know, to varying degrees, but the reality is, is that stress is on the, on the up. Clinically, um, I see an awful lot of people who are stressed, um, and my colleague Stephen, who's not here today, who I have to say was meant to be co-presenting me with um, today, and actually... Um, couldn't be here at the last minute. He assures me that looking after 15-month-old twins um, in a premier inn in Stratford, in Stratford is just as bad, but I'm not quite convinced. So, But um, I'm also wondering whether Steve McMurray, did you raise your hand there? Yeah, apparently, again, I was talking to Mark over lunch. I know absolutely nothing about rugby, but my husband assures me that you've had an incredibly stressful two months. <laughs> OK, so I'll take his word for it. Superficially, I don't know anything about rugby, apart from appreciating men, generally, probably. <laughs> so anyway, I should say no more. I don't think we should go any further into that. OK, so stress accounts for a lot of work-related illness. In fact, 40% of all work-related illness is through stress. So we've got to take this pretty seriously. It's a big problem. Factors that attribute to this stress our work pressure it goes without saying it's on the increase we're more we're expected to do more for for less um, lack of managerial support that's a biggie um, bullying in the workplace a friend of mine when i told her i was going to do this talk said to me actually joe people don't leave good jobs they just leave a bad manager <laughs> and i thought actually that's really pertinent so um, i'm going to remember that just want to show you um, this. this is, I'm going to use the terms emotional well-being and mental health kind of interchangeably throughout this presentation. Um, I think hopefully emotional well-being is slightly more acceptable in the current climate. I think we still, the reality is we still have problems with the term mental illness, mental health. So emotional well-being is the new buzzword, so we're going to use that, okay? But occasionally I'll just slip back into the old kind of style of, of talking. So you can see here that anxiety and depression and stress accounts for a huge proportion um, of mental health diagnosis. Again, at the bottom here, you can see that in terms of thinking about the precipitating events of stress, um, factors intrinsic to the job, changes in our workplace, interpersonal relationships there, they stress us out essentially, they're the biggies, okay, so I just want us to bear that in mind, okay. Um, my focus today is obviously educational settings, okay, so we're going to kind of go from a global kind of the fact that we're all stressed in the workplace and start thinking about teachers. I quite like this slide. <laughs> I'm not a teacher, but I feel regularly like banging my head against a brick wall sometimes, especially in the NHS. Um, the NAS UWT have identified that stress and professional burnout among teachers in the UK contributes significantly to an unnecessary and wasteful exodus from the profession. Um, teaching has the highest level of mental health problems. You know, that beats nursing, it beats doctors. We've got a lot of very stressed out teachers who are experiencing mental health difficulties. Of course, we're thinking about education, so we're not just worried about teachers and, and staff, but we're also thinking about children. Um, this is a fairly self-explanatory slide. One in ten children will have a mental health problem. That's an awful lot. In fact, I think that's quite a conservative estimate. Um, anxiety and depression um, over the last 25 years has increased 70%. That is astronomical. That is huge. We have a lot of children out there who need support and guidance. Half of all individuals with lifetime mental health problems will first experience them by the age of 14. So we need to get in quickly. We need to intervene. We need to promote emotional well-being. We need to reduce that stigma of mental health and we need to support these children. We know it's been said already this morning that in terms of if we enhance emotional well-being, we get best, better educational attainment, we get better 
school outcomes generally, we get less exclusion, we get greater attendance. And of course, what we're doing is we're developing the children of the future. We don't want children not fulfilling their potential. We don't want them experiencing mental health problems. We want them to be positive and we want them to have an enhanced emotional well-being. Okay. Okay. So, we need to take emotional well-being seriously. We can't just brush it under the carpet and pretend it doesn't exist. This has happened for a long time. So fortunately, thank goodness, the government and lots of relative agencies have cottoned on to the fact that we can't ignore this problem that we've got. We can't ignore the fact that we've got lots of stressed out teachers. We can't ignore the fact that actually we've got lots of children who are also suffering silently a lot of the time and not getting the support and access to services that they should. Okay. So fortunately, nice. Finally, finally, it seems like a long time ago, but in 2009, published guidance to support staff in secondary education in meeting the statutory responsibilities in promoting social and emotional well-being. And how did they do this? Well, they have suggested, shock, horror, it's a bit, a little bit, you know, a bit um, kind of apart from a lot of the way that a lot of people think is that opportunities are needed to reflect upon and develop their own social and emotional skills and awareness. Bit touchy-feely bit touchy-feely, commonplace for psychologists like myself, but the reality is that we need to give teachers the ability to reflect on the experiences and the difficulties that they're having on a daily basis, okay? And it's a symbiotic relationship because if we have healthy teachers, we have healthy children. If we have healthy children, we have healthy teachers. So it's, a, it's an important relationship. Okay, so we've got this message that we need to take mental health and we need to take stress seriously in um, educational settings. And the idea is that we have a lot, we've, we've taught, heard a lot from people today about the fact that we've got a lot of experience, we've got a lot of people out there that can offer their services, their experience, and we can empower other people to improve their emotional well-being. And this can be done... Fortunately, schools like Pocklington, in conjunction with myself and Mark, um, Mark Ronan, we've been thinking about how we can promote emotional well-being in educational settings, and that's really important. So we've got the guidance, we've got the nice guidelines, they're saying, come on, take this responsibly. You know, staff need support, teachers need support, they need um, reflective practice. Of course, this is something that clinical psychologists do on a daily basis. I couldn't do my job clinically if I didn't have the support mechanisms to do that. I have supervision, um, which is the ability to talk about the things and the difficulties that I have in my, in my practice, the things that are elicited in me when I see particular patients. You know, does a particular patient remind me of my father? Do I need to explore that a little bit in supervision? Do I need to think about how that might affect the work that I'm doing? So we have a whole support network in clinical psychology which is about reflective practice. So fundamentally, my mission, if I choose to accept it, is to try to bring reflective practice into a school. And that's what I've been trying to do in conjunction with um, Mark Ronan. And it starts from the top. You're there, Mark, at the very top. Should have put a little picture there <laughs> um, as the headmaster. And it goes, and you can see that it filters down through senior management, through pastoral staff, teaching and support staff, and obviously the child. And obviously, I'd like to say that obviously that also includes relationships with the parents as well. Um, it's a really complex environment at school, and there's lots of pressure, there's lots of pressure points across the spectrum, you can imagine at every level. And the idea is, is that through one-to-one -one conversations, through reflective practice, we can help to enhance well-being. We can promote a safe environment where teachers feel comfortable to be able to talk through their difficulties, their stresses, their strains, um, in a confidential way, which is really important. So. I do apologise about this pyramid being pink. My daughter insisted that it was pink because she loves all things pink. As you can see, my cards are pink, everything's pink. Um, 
reflective practice is really important. And you can see also as well what we can start to do is think about tailored psychological education and training with each of these levels in the pyramid. Um, at the moment, one of Mark and I's kind of little babies that we have is to, not literally together, <laughs> isn't too bad, but um, is to support, <laughs> yeah, is to support, uh, is to support past the pastoral staff. They are under a huge amount of pressure. These are people who not only often have teaching roles, but they have the roles of being a surrogate, a surrogate parent. They have to li liaise with the children. They have to li liaise with parents, maybe late at night, ringing up going, oh, uh, you know, my Johnny's just rung me on his mobile phone. He's not had a very good day today. Lots of complications, lots of stresses, lots of strains. So what Mark and I have done is we've set up a reflective practice group whereby myself and my colleague Stephen, we meet with the um, pastoral um, teachers and, and members of staff and we have a reflective group. We talk through issues that have arisen very confidentially, be it issues with pupils, be it um, issues with staff. Okay? And as we all know, we all have issues. We are social animals. We try to interact with people. Sometimes we fail at that. And the reality is, is that we have difficult relationships to manage. Lots of the work that Mark and I end up talking about in some of our individual sessions are difficulties trying to interact with certain members of staff, maybe people kind of struggling to behave professionally at times when they're under strain. And again, we all have worlds outside our work. You know, we have interpersonal relationships that can go wrong. We have bereavements. We have all of these things that make our lives really, really difficult at times. You all raised your hand. You've all had stress at work, but we all have stresses and strains individually as well. So we need to be aware that all of these difficulties we have, and they come into our workplace and they can make our environment incredibly stressful. So hopefully what you can see is that what we, Stephen and I kind of try to do is provide a model of reflective practice. And that can be one-to-one. Um, -one. It can also be, be in a group format, and it can also be providing issues around complex case consultation. So it may well be a particular child is causing some kinds of difficulties. Stephen and I can come in, we can do a psychological assessment, a formulation which is a psychological understanding of that particular child's difficulties, where they are, what the problems are. We can signpost, which is a huge um, area, trying to get the right person for the right job. Stephen and I haven't got the solutions just because we're clinical psychologists. It doesn't mean that we're the professionals to solve everybody's problems. I've heard a lot today. There's so much experience in this room. There's so much, there's so much people can give. And it's about trying to get the right person to the right place at the right time. And that's how we can enhance emotional wellbeing and ensure that we are supporting people accordingly. Um, we negotiate confidentiality quite regularly to make sure that the best people know about the best things at the right time, rather than this kind of very closed model which often exists in schools because people worry about who they say what to when. Um, and Stephen and I are experienced at negotiating, negotiating confidentiality. That's what clinical psychologists do. That's what we're used to. Um, so we do that. And of course, we liaise with parents as well. So hopefully that's explain my very beautiful pink pyramid. Okay. And finally, just to kind of think a little bit about what reflective practice is, because you're probably sat there thinking, hmm, what's this reflective practice malarkey, this clinical psychologist? Um, what, what is reflective practice? Well, first of all, it's a therapeutic presence. It's about providing a safe and a confidential environment with which teachers, support staff, children, anyone within the school setting can come to and feel safe. It's not about joss sticks and bean bags and sitting around kind of smoking or whatever. It's not that, you know, it's not too touchy-feely, hopefully. It is about a confidential environment. And, and those actually don't exist as much as you think in a, in, a, in a school setting. Because, of course, we have line management, we have colleagues, we have friends. Sometimes you don't quite know who to tell information to. Sometimes information gets into the wrong hands. <laughs> Sometimes that causes difficulties. So being able to transport the clinical psychology model into education is actually really important because you can provide a confidential safe space. And that's what that's about. 
in terms of psychoeducation, that's another fundamental part of reflective practice and that's about being able to think psychologically, it's about being able to think in a cognitive way, explore cognitive models, think about things like validation, thinking about things as like normalisation. These are important factors when we're trying to get people to feel more comfortable. When they have a difficult situation, it's useful to be able to talk about it. It's useful for me as a psychologist to be able to sit there and say, that sounds perfectly normal to me. That sounds really difficult. The thing is, is that the way that the school system is, is constructed, sometimes you don't necessarily get that from your manager. Um, and we need to be thinking about how we train and we support our managers to be able to develop these skills. And that's also what Stephen and I are really interested in, is kind of enhancing the skills that do exist in the educational setting. It's not about Stephen and I coming in and saying, we're clinical psychologists, you're rubbish at that, you can't talk to people, you don't know how to provide a confidential space. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about enhancing the skills that these staff already have, and they probably just don't know they have it. So it's about exploring safely a way to develop that. Okay. In terms of challenging different ways of thinking, sometimes we find, I know I'm guilty of it, we get stuck in a rut, we think about things in a particular way. And the idea with clinical psychology is to promote a different way of thinking, to have a strategy, to think around it, think about new ways of learning and developing. And in, as I was saying earlier, enhance the skill set that, that these teachers already have, but maybe approaching a situation in a slightly different way. So maybe looking at the relationship that they have with a, particularly, a particular colleague and thinking, well, maybe I could approach this situation in a different way. Maybe rather than berating them or being annoyed at them, I can try to support them, think about maybe what's going on for them. You know, maybe, these, maybe this particular colleague has a difficulty at home that I'm not aware of. And again, it's about supporting managers to ask the right questions and create an environment where people are going to tell them things. Having a stressful, a stressful period at, at work means that sometimes you don't want to talk about it, you don't want to share it with your manager, you don't want to share it with your colleagues. So there's lots of complex situations that can arise, which again, as clinical psychologists, we try to encourage people to talk about. Okay, and finally, reflective practice in terms of enhancing well-being involves applying psychological models and psychological principles. And I do this an awful lot with the staff that I see um, when I meet with Mark and we have one-to-one -one, um, clinical supervision, we talk and think about how psychology and the knowledge and the immense amount of um, development and models that we have can be used and applied to day-to-day -to -day situations. So for example, how um, models such as transaction analysis, which is you know, a really good model for kind of thinking about the interactions we get ourselves into on a daily basis. The fact that maybe, for example, we, we um, form a particular relationship, but we have, we, we going to, we're a persecutor, we're, we're, we can be victims. All of these things we can think about and apply and think about how we can improve our relationships with our colleagues by actually thinking psychologically. And that doesn't mean that I'm trying to breed a bunch of mini clinical psychologists because I appreciate the fact that actually we have teaching staff. They're not psychologists, but it's a way of enhancing and supporting them in a very, very, very difficult environment. And I still can't, and I know I'll say it again, I still can't believe that teachers and support staff have such a complexity and array of difficult situations to deal with and they have no support mechanism to deal with that. And so it's my mission to try to bring reflective practice into an educational environment and support, support staff to realise their potential, to enhance their emotional well-being and hopefully fundamentally reduce their stress which I think is probably quite a huge mission, but in conjunction with really forward positive schools like Pocklington, you know, like individuals like Mark, who are willing to embrace external support. And as I say, the support and the, the expertise that exists in this room, it's a really clever and fundamental way of driving forward well-being and enhancing it on every level and that's really fundamental to me and I just find it is a really exciting opportunity to use all of the skills 
that I've acquired over the last 12 years of practicing individually on a clinical level and being able to bring it into a clinic, into a, a teaching setting and hoping that some of those skills, some of the knowledge, some of the models and all of this reflective practice will actually support and help teachers to improve their emotional well-being and also the children because let's not forget the children as well. It's really important, like I said earlier, to give them access to good quality support so that they can fulfil. They are our future and they are the potential. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>